Tell me if this sounds like clickbait. Ancient Australian Aboriginal memory tool superior to memory palace learning. I mean, I thought so too. It must be clickbait. What could be superior to the memory palace? And I even got more concerned when Dominic O'Brien tweeted the neuroscience article and added this statement. In short, link or story method combined with journey method provide the optimum learning strategy. Now, with all due respect to Dominic and acknowledgement of his great accomplishments and wonderful books teaching that has impacted me, this is not precisely what the neuroscience article says, nor is it what the full study says. Neither of them even contain the word journey. Now, because I'm human too, I decided not to battle about this on Twitter because, you know, angry birds just ain't my shtick and shouldn't be anyone's. In fact, I simply retweeted it with a link to the original study and with sincere humility in the space of this video journey into memory where I know all of you do your own due diligence and deep critical reflection before offering your thoughts on any platform. Let me offer this reply. For a memory expert, myself, Dominic O'Brien, or anyone to, shall we say, shape what a study says by promoting it with a quasi-branded term like journey method, this should be a wake-up call to the human and the humanness in us all. Because as educators, it's normal to get excited by anything in the world of science that validates what we've been saying all along. Memory techniques work. I'm sure, in haste, I've done something like shape an article too so that it fit a particular term. And in this fast-paced world, I probably will do so again. And all the more reason that we must be on our guard and seek to go beyond the headlines, beyond the tweets, to temper ourselves so that we can truly learn from the research and what the research actually says and hopefully improve how we teach and learn while avoid getting territorial in ways that risk placing borders on the wonder the majesty and the miracle of human memory. Because quite frankly, I noticed a small tremor of territorialism in myself at the idea that something could be better than the memory palace. Imagine that, getting territorial over a word. Even though I often remind you that this term, memory palace, is just a word, a term for location-based mnemonics and nothing more. And so knowing that there must be more to this study than anyone could hope to convey in a tweet, I read the full paper myself. And to get even more detail, I reached out to David Reeser at Monash University. Now, as a neuroscientist with interest in attention, consciousness, and many aspects of education, he's the head author on the study that several dozen people have emailed me about since the story broke. The study is called Australian Aboriginal Techniques for Memorization, Translation into a Medical and Allied Health Education Setting. And it turns out the medical and health education setting matter a great deal. And there are several more nuances that make this study very, very interesting. And frankly, Dr. Reeser is so good at explaining the science, I'm happy to say that if all of us educators and students can get on the same page, share these findings around, and collaborate with those members in the Aboriginal community who hold knowledge we should be very excited about, why then, there might just be something many magnitudes better, and better than whatever you want to call the memory techniques you currently use. But we do have to pay the price of attending to accuracy. And so with that in mind, I'm grateful Dr. Reeser spent this time with us to discuss the study, the nature of its implications, the nature of scientific research, and what we can all do to learn and explore more. You'll find links to Dr. Reeser and the full study in the video description, along with a few supplementary notes. Please spend some time on the reading. Share your thoughts, and if you're new here, get subscribed because I'm hoping to record a follow-up interview with Tyson Yunkaporta, who also worked on the study and even took people out to teach them this technique. So if you, like me, care about the memory tradition and our quest for the truth about what really works, you're going to want to get subscribed and not miss a thing. And now, without further ado, let's begin what I hope you will find to be a very fruitful discussion with Dr. David Reeser. David, thanks so much for joining me on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast. Really appreciate it. And, you know, thanks for doing this research because uh, it's so many people use these techniques and they're always looking for an edge, different ways to do it. I'm especially interested for a reason we'll get into with this uh, research, but I, I appreciate both those things. And maybe just by way of introduction, let us know a little bit about your your work and how that this project emerged. Sure. And thank you, Anthony, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, 
my work generally is in the field of connectional neuroscience. So I am very interested in how brain areas are connected to each other and what uh, what role they play in what are called functional networks and what that might mean for behavior and understanding. So my, if you will, regular research is not um, generally in the field of memory. It's a little bit related to the field of attention. But what got me interested in this is I uh, started doing my teaching work down at the Rural Health School for Monash in Churchill, Victoria, which um, is the graduate entry school for Monash medical students. So people who've had an undergraduate degree already, if they want to go to medical school at Monash, they come through the year A program down there. And we were working on a number of things with uh, one of the indigenous health educators, uh, Dr. Tyson Yonkaporta, who's um, himself an expert in education generally, but also has a strong background and uh, has authored a couple of books on relationships and, and the way that uh, Aboriginal people manage the land and, and the custodial relationship they have with the land. And he happened to be down there one day when I was um, working with some colleagues and we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do during the orientation period for the uh, upcoming medical school year. And we got to talking about Lynn Kelly's book, The Memory Code, and, and some other things. And I commented, and he agreed, that the Aboriginal method, as it was described, is fairly close to the method of loci or, or to certainly to the memory palace technique. And there were and are obviously some differences that I, I hope we'll get a chance to talk about. But um, <clears throat> one of the things that came up in that conversation was whether there was perhaps a, a way to directly compare that. And the comparison that we're interested in is partially due to the performance of the two techniques, but more it was, was there one or the other that was better for incorporation into a medical school context? And I think that um, really drove the research. Is it's obviously thousands of years of history that people have been developing these techniques. It wasn't going to be the case that one reasonably sized study in one medical school class was going to answer the question, what's, you know, which one is the best right, right. rather we were interested in, could we use them in a context where the students only get a very limited amount of time to train on anything that isn't directly medically related. So that was the first thing is not so much was one technique better than the other, but was, teaching the Aboriginal technique efficient for use in the medical school program? That was the first question. And the second question kind of grows out of that, which is Tyson had mentioned, and I share his concern, that even though Indigenous health is a key part of the curriculum and what we teach in the School of Rural Health, there's often a an emphasis on just the health problems that affect Aboriginal communities and that in a sense is understandable because we are a medical program, but what ends up sometimes being the case is that students have their only exposure to Aboriginal health or indigenous health being the prevalence of a particular disease or the way that it affects one population disproportionately than another. And they don't really get a sense of Aboriginal culture or what drives the um, relationships within the community. The, 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 some of the richness is kind of lost to that. And so one of the other things we wanted to do in, in teaching this method was give students a chance to experience a little bit of that right. um, and to be able to incorporate that indigenous component into our medical curriculum and have the opportunity for students to just get a little taste because obviously we're only talking here about a couple of hours of total time. But just get a little bit of a, a taste of, of what the Aboriginal culture entails in terms of knowledge and learning and education and what that might mean in, in a medical context. Right. Well, it's amazing. And just for listeners, I have been in contact with Tyson and hope to interview him under its own episode. But, you know, this, there's a lot going on here. And I know you also have all other authors that are are part of this as well. So we should acknowledge that these projects can be quite involved with a, a network of people. Um, so if we miss anything, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work on getting, getting it all in there, but there's a lot that you said there and lots of threads to follow. 
Um, I guess my first question would be because this is the nature of all the emails that I received. And the excitement was this idea that something better has been found. Right. Now, you've sort of alerted a bit of concern around that. What are your feelings about how media treats the way that they report on new scientific papers? I'll be honest. I was more skeptical of it before we had this experience than I am now. Um, the the overwhelming majority of the people that I've talked to, and I've talked to a number of journalists and yourself in the podcast domain, and I think there's one other podcast later in the week that was interested in, in doing some work, um, the level of effort that people have put into getting it right and to making sure that in the time that's allowed. And I think that's really the problem. You know, you might only have a five or a 700 word article, but to be able to get some of the nuance in there and get some of what we're actually saying about not just the techniques, but the efficiency of using the techniques, mm -hmm. um, that subtlety I, I kind of expected to be lost. And I, I was actually pleasantly surprised. A lot of people have put a lot of time and effort into getting that right. Mm -hmm. So I was really pleased by that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I don't have the full sort of story of exactly how that this was presented to the students, and that's part of what I am very curious about. But it seems to me just from reading the the, the paper as such, uh, which I was able to find through a university, I have QUT access here through my wife. Uh, so I read the whole paper. And uh, from what I understand, it, it just based on what is there, is that the core difference is that a teacher is bringing the individual into the space of encoding. And there didn't seem to be much details beyond that in terms of what the, that Aboriginal uh, mythos or content or metaphor, uh, the word metaphor comes up in the study, what that actual content was. So I'm kind of curious, um, when they're interpreting it as better, what it, what is the key ingredient? Because I think the key ingredient there is different. Um, and that was a, a key point of difference between the two techniques. Um, I should also say that was one of the reasons that we were we were really happy to publish in PLOS One because it is open access. So if, if any of your listeners are, are curious to see the actual study, um, it should be publicly available to them. Um, or at least it's been reproduced and linked to now enough times that hopefully it, it shouldn't be a problem to get access to it. Um, I'm happy to send it to people if they want to email me directly as well. Right. Um, as far as the differences go, that is one key difference that in the actual training context of what we did and keeping in mind that this whole phase of, of collecting data only lasted a couple of hours, um, the training phase for the memory palace was more like a classroom lecture. So I stood in front of, a, of the group of students who had the memory palace assigned to them and gave a little bit of a spiel of what the memory palace was, did a, a kind of a whiteboard talk explaining how you would look at an imaginary room. In the case of the, the study, we asked them to use their childhood bedroom so that everybody would have at least one familiar kind of point of reference. Right. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about it for about 20, uh, a few minutes, and the whole session was about 25, 30 minutes. And then we had each student sort of imaginary, or excuse me, imagine their own childhood bedroom and, and start to build a memory palace around that. In the Aboriginal method, um, Tyson actually took students out to a rock garden that's located on, the, on our campus. And that... We had chosen in advance because it had a number of, of distinct features like plants and rock formations that matched the number of, of items that we were trying to recall. Right. And, <clears throat> excuse me, he took them to this garden, told them a little bit about the method, and then walked them through the garden, building a narrative that had each element incorporated into a feature in the garden. So that was a key point of difference is that Tyson was actually out there. They they walked around the space, whereas in the Memory Palace, obviously, it's an imaginary space. So even though we told them how to do it, um, there was no real physical location that they could visit. That was one key point of difference. The other point of difference, and, and several of uh, the people who've contacted me, and I think um, you may have alluded to it as well, is 
in the memory palace technique, each student built their own. So it was based on their childhood experience or their childhood bedroom. Whereas this, the story that was used in the Aboriginal technique was common to all the students because they constructed it when they went out to the rock garden. Right. So Tyson led them through there. They built up this narrative and the narrative I think is the key point here. Um, and then each student came away with a story that they all had heard that had each of the elements on the, the recall list in it. Right. And, and so that is a key point of difference. And I think it is one of the key reasons why when we say one is, we weren't really trying to say one is better than the other. We were actually looking for the differences that might make it useful or not useful in a classroom setting. And as it happens, that narrative element, which maybe I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves and we'll talk about it a little bit more, um, but when we, when we talk about the data, but that narrative element is very likely a key contributor to why the recall performance in this short-term study was better yeah. for the Aboriginal method than it was for the memory palace. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all that makes sense. And uh, one of the th one of the concerns that I had with it is because there it seems in some of the tweets that I've seen about it going back and forth is that there instantly comes like a territorial over whose term uh, works better. So, oh, this is more like the journey method, and now the method of loci is broken or whatever. But in my mind, the the I mean, just let me let me give some context. I trained to teach memory techniques with Tony Buzan, who had. Oh, okay created the world memory championships and one of the exercises we did with him was walking around memorizing the names of the countries in the area that we were there and i thought that was brilliant uh, because we're sort of having this shared communal use of of space and whatever associations we were even you know trading notes on our associations um so this is this is not um like a fundamental surprise to me that the findings would would uh, come out in this way because uh, this is just of course if you can do it together um, uh, amazing uh, but there is that sort of burden that a lot of people wouldn't have that opportunity and they do need to do it sort of solo uh, at least their first time in terms of traditional memory palace um, but in any case yeah it all, I mean, it, it's intuitive to me that you would have these findings and and I'll be honest, I, I wasn't so much that I expected one technique or another to be better. It was that I expected that using a technique or any kind of systematic approach would be better than not using one, which I think is a fairly um, kind of almost a truism. But right. <laughs> the, the other thing to remember is that these students were literally on their second or third day of medical school. They had never met for the most part. A few of them knew each other from undergraduate, but you know, they're plunked into a strange environment and being hammered with a ton of information. Most of it related to this is where you go to get this paperwork done. And you know, this, this is what we mean when we talk about these horrific end of semester assessments that are coming up in 18 weeks or whatever. Right. And then they get, thrown into this pool of saying, and by the way, we're just going to just check and see if any of you perform better if we ask some memory questions of you that are utterly unrelated to medicine. So it was a bit of a shock to the students as well. I think they, they were fantastic in their attitude about it. And I think um, some of the positive response, and I should also say that um, one thing about this study that hasn't been talked about a lot because of the quantitative data that we had, we did... Um, a follow-up qualitative study as well. So the students were asked to give their impressions and to talk about um, what they thought was useful or not useful about this technique. And that part of the study, which was run by uh, Dr. Margaret Simmons, who is the third co-author on the study, so we have kind of shared equal credit on those. Um, what she found was, A, about 97% of these students were convinced that memorization was going to be a huge component of medicine. And that was really telling to me because they're not doctors yet. Well, actually, <laughs> given that we've advanced a couple of years since we actually uh, collected the data, they're about to become doctors. Right. Um, so the, I believe this group is, is graduating this year. Um, but a lot of what they had going in was an expectation about what memorization would involve for medicine. And I think the modern medical curriculum hasn't completely removed rote memorization from it, for sure. 
but there's a lot of the emphasis of it. A lot of the emphasis now is on learning to relate to patients and on learning to be organized and, and committed to being good at getting the information you need. There's, there's some degree less uh, emphasis on rote memorization than there may have been even 20 years ago. Right. Um, and so the students had a kind of a, a very preconceived notion about not only what medicine involved, but also what role memorization played in it. And so I think that that was one of the reasons that they were so enthusiastic, but also one of the reasons that they were so motivated. Um, and the surprising thing about that is, again, maybe getting a little ahead of ourselves when we talk about the data, but when we looked at the, the data from all three groups before they had any training at all, all of them were very, very good. And these were extremely good students to get into the program. And most of them at one level or another, even if they hadn't consciously done it, had built up a skill set that would allow them to handle what ended up being a relatively benign memory task. I mean, as you talk about the World Memory Championships where somebody might take just a few minutes to memorize two or three decks of cards and the sequences involved there. Um, this is nothing like that. This was nowhere near that challenging. So these were good students who probably already knew a lot about memorization without having to really think about it. And they were given a task that was moderate difficulty. So um, maybe we can, I, oh, please. Oh, please. Um, so I think that was, um, again, the, the, Thing that maybe got just a little bit lost in the publicity around the study is a big part of what we were doing was trying to fit it into the context of teaching medicine right. more than we were trying to get people interested or skilled in the art of memory, which is a totally separate thing that I completely respect, right. but takes years of practice and continual sort of upgrading of your skills. And there are different techniques for different types of memorization and so on. Um, we just didn't have time to explore all of that. Right, right. Well, that's good, to, that's good to know because that didn't leap out at me either in, in what I read because um, that that sort of depth of exposure to, well, maybe this is where we can loop in some of your expertise with attention. You know, they would have had exercised their attention spans to a certain degree already for that kind of semantic content and uh, uh well, I mean, that's my question. It, is there a measurable way to test someone's advantage going in uh, a, a little bit more robustly, or <coughs> did it uh, matter for your question. study? That's a it's a really important question. Um, if you wanted to do that, yes, there is, and I, and I, the emphasis would be on trying to test a representative sample of the general population, as opposed to a pre-selected sample of incoming medical students and. You know, these are academic experts. There's no way around it. Um, right. To to get into a medicine program is competitive. These are students who, by and large, knew for years that they wanted to do medicine and had applied themselves very diligently to get into the program. So they were academic all-stars. Right. Um, and the question of how you would take advantage of the, the strengths of this technique in a population that wasn't quite so pre-selected um, was one that we touched upon, but it wasn't something that we did in depth. And the way that we touched upon it was, again, with that qualitative element, we looked at some of the feedback that was given by students in an undergraduate course who had been taught by Tyson to use this technique in um, memorizing what is a very complicated biochemical pathway called the tricarboxylic acid pathway, um, which has a number of steps. And it's a classic sort of intimidating diagram in biochemistry to say, you know, go learn all of the steps and intermediate chemicals that come out of this conversion of, of sugar into energy. And um, the students, by and large, reacted the same way to it. They were enthusiastic about the technique and they felt that it was good to have some systematization to what they were doing. But more importantly, what held their attention, to go back to your reference to attention, was the Aboriginal component. They enjoyed learning how other cultures and and very ancient cultures had developed these skills. Right. You know, it wasn't an accident. They needed them. It was it was a, an essential tool, not just for survival, but for cultural survival. Yeah. You know, one of the things that that people maybe um, 
we would have liked to talk about more, but we didn't really have a chance to, but Tyson has talked about in several of his books, is a lot of what goes into the, the memorization is learning cultural relationships, learning um, politics and law and things that, you know, we kind of in m more Western societies have industrialized or specialized to a point where if you want to know about law, you go hire a lawyer and, you know, they've got what their knowledge is plus a thousand books on their wall that tell them exactly what section X of the code says about this. If you don't have that, or if your relationship is as part of a smaller community, you know, the law is what people remember the law to be. And it, it's very important that that not get distorted. So okay. it isn't just, oh, I remember where this water source is or where this food source is, which is important and is certainly knowledge that can be encoded. But there are also subtleties of politics and interaction and relationships that are equally important to the survival of the culture. And I think that um, the students in the undergraduate course, as well as in the medicine course, were really surprised by that, as I was, because I knew very little about Aboriginal culture when I moved okay. to Australia. And, you know, it, it really was a revelation to me um, and to, I think, to the students as well. So the what drove their attention and their willingness to participate and their willingness to apply this technique is the additional knowledge that says there's not just, this isn't just um, remembering where you put your car keys. This is a cultural and a culturally significant component of something that people unfortunately don't have a lot of exposure to or haven't had the opportunity to learn about. Yeah, well, this is, this is so much of the great gifts that Lynn Kelly has done for the tradition, because typically we have to tell, you know, Simonides of Kos or sure. Simonides or whatever. And it's just, it's a little bit, I mean, yeah, he escaped from a crushed uh, or a collapsing building and so forth, but it's not as rich and engaging a story as, you know, how are you going to remember what plants to eat or not when there's a drought? And how are you going to pass people through you know, important functions in society because you can test them for their suitedness uh, and so forth. So yeah, that it's just a much more gripping sort of cultural story. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's it. funny because I've, I've heard the, um, and I'm going to mess up the pronunciation because I got connected by it by another uh, interviewer earlier in the week and she happened to be a Greek and corrected my pronunciation, which now I've, I've got a hybrid of correct and incorrect pronunciations of <laughs> Simonides, I think, was what she said. Um, but in any event, that story comes up over and over again. The ones that I find really interesting about the the memory palace technique also kind of go into the Middle Ages. And, and one of the things that struck me in my reading, um, there's the story of Father Matteo, who went to a, a yes. Jesuit priest who went to China and um, sort of embedded himself in the in the Chinese bureaucracy by teaching the sons of Chinese bureaucrats. Yes. Because unfortunately at the time it was only the sons, but you know, the, for them to study for these incredibly complicated civil service exams, he taught them this memory palace technique and had success with it. That was interesting to me. The other one that is probably not as emphasized is, you know, we take for granted the availability of, of books and libraries, but before the Gutenberg press came around, a book was a really unusual thing. You know, it was a very expensive process to get a book made. It was an incredibly valuable object. Even an educated person, you know, someone who's dedicated their life to scholarship might only see a book for a little while in their life and they might only get one exposure to it. Yeah. So they travel to these libraries, the Library of Alexandria or the Library at, Guten at um, Mainz in Germany, wherever. They might only get a, a, one shot at reading a thing. Yep. And without a trained memory and without the ability to retain the information, you know, it was as if they'd never been there. They were, you know, they read it and then they were gone and then memory is gone. They really depended on having what we would consider almost superhuman memories. But to them, it was the point of training for years and years was to get your memory into that shape. And I think another thing that Lynn Kelly has done a real service to is to say, you know, everybody in this in the same sense that if you ask somebody to draw a picture, they say, oh, I can't draw. And you ask somebody to remember even 20 things. Oh, I have a terrible memory. Yeah. Well, in fact, they don't. And, they, you know, they are good at drawing. They just haven't practiced. And, and they are good at memorizing far more than 20 things. 
they just haven't had exposure to the either the need to do it or to good techniques to do it. So yeah, I think, I mean, you know, it is really interesting to me how these stories, you know, people focus on the one event or the one story and say, this is why you should have a good memory. But there was a lot of, of pressure, you know, going into pre-industrial societies, even Western pre-industrial societies to absolutely. polish your memory to be, you know, it was, it was a mark of a good education. Well, you may be excited to know, but one of my students right now is working on a translation of Shi Guajifa, which was oh. Matteo Ricci's book. Yeah, that he wrote uh, after 12 years of being in China, he was good enough to write about his memory techniques. And so, you know, I'm sort of playing entrepreneur behind the scenes, but he's working on the translation. I've read it in a German translation and uh, my, I don't have any classical Chinese. I only have some, some modern contemporary Mandarin, but we're very excited about that. Um, oh, I'll be very keen to read that. Hopefully um, it'll be, you know, within a year or so. I, I wish a student all the all the success with that because it's something that should get out there. I mean, I, I'm I, I said it earlier today to someone else. I, I love technology as long as it has an off switch. Yeah. Um, I'm a big <laughs> I'm a big fan of books. I'm a big fan of handwritten notes. Um, I tell medical students all the time. You know, they want they want, and it's it's the way we have conditioned them. It's not a, a defect in modern students. I'm not the kind of old guy who says, oh, we had it easier or better when I was a kid. That's not the way it is. Um, by providing all of the access to electronic information and by giving prepared notes and slides and everything else to classes, it's convenient in one sense for the students in terms of their review because they don't have to look around for all the information. I think something does get lost in the sense that even if you don't think you're good at drawing or you don't think that you're good at remembering things, the act of drawing a diagram that you saw in a lecture or the act of reproducing um, a passage of text that someone said, these are things that actually do strengthen your memory and actually can be very useful if you don't have access to the technology solutions that we use most of the time. If, you, if you're not near your phone or your phone is out of battery or you, you know, you're in the middle of a surgery and you've got your arms deeply inside a patient, you don't want to be Googling information. No, <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> over your shoulder and saying, hey, somebody, quick, look this up. You never uh, know, though. At one point in the future, we may swallow Google so we have it inside of our bodies and they can refer I'm to sure it while they're doing love surgery. To be inside of everybody's body. I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to make the inside of my body as unpleasant as possible for Google. <laughs> um, they're going to get there and they're going to see a wasteland. Well, I, I think you've hit upon one of the core paradoxes of our time because, uh, and maybe you can speak to this in, in, with respect to attention and the study itself, is that we, we still have brains that are you know, more or less adapted to the savanna and jungles and, and all this sort of stuff. And when we have all of the information at a keystroke, we have this kind of feast hunter sort of syndrome that switches on. And so it's like 45 tabs instead of that one article that we need to read it's just like, yeah, but all these other tabs, and then you find yourself reading one paragraph and then switching over to the next thing and so forth. So is there a way that you can conceive of, and obviously this technique is part of that way, but where we could deal with the 45 tab syndrome and still use our attention to focus on the one thing at a time and still enjoy the fact that we can follow all the links and, you know... Every That's a really great question. Have Spotify well. playing, etc. You know, I preface this by saying I would not consider myself a master or an expert in either the discipline sense or the scientific sense um, of memory, and my knowledge of attention is tangential to the research that I do. But I would say this: I think you know we have spent a lot of time and effort. Sorry for the dog barking in the background. He's decided that the neighbors need to know that he's home because they're home. Um, I'm sure you'll edit that out. But the idea of the savanna and the, the adaptation to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, I think, is an important one. But I think it also risks obscuring another part of, of what is really special about the, the human brain, as I understand it, which is it really is an adaptive mechanism. It's not so much that it's adapted to something. It's that through hundreds of thousands and, and depending on how far you want to go back billions of years of natural selection, we have a learning engine and we have a brain that is remarkably good at 
sorting information and picking what's important for survival and eventually picking what's important for relationships, because that is something that we depend on heavily. And I think that, you know, the, there's the romance of saying, oh, we have all done the savanna and we're hunters and gatherers and, and we're constantly searching for predators and things. But there's been a lot of work that suggests that um, even in hunter-gatherer societies today, a fair amount of the day is spent interacting with people and, and yeah. managing relationships. It's not so much that every moment of your day is spent seeking meat or avoiding predators or finding the best source of nuts. That's certainly an important component of survival. But even in, in if you look carefully at the, the um, what we might say, I, I, I hate to use the word primitive because they're not primitive cultures at all, but the less industrialized cultures that are still surviving, there's an awful lot of politics and there's an awful lot of deception and there's an awful lot of managing relationships and who's married to whom, who's cheating on whom, who's trying to get what they want or, you know, whose ambition is so great for their family that they're willing to do X or Y or Z to get what they need. And, and that is really a critical component of any lifestyle, not just a modern lifestyle or an industrial lifestyle. That's a human lifestyle. And so the adaptation to the savanna, I think is important, but it can be overplayed. I think, um, it's always interesting to me that when you look at, um, data from non-human primates in the wild. So gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, um, baboons, which there have been some superb studies on, on those societies. They're intricate. You know, they, they, a lot of what they do is finding food and sleeping, but a, almost everything else that they do during the day is not avoiding predators or, or you know, hiding from eagles. It's, it's interacting with each other. And it's, right. it's, deciding who's in the group and who's out of the group and who deserves food and who doesn't deserve food. And how do I make sure that my offspring, which I can tell, you know, the, to a human eye look like all the other bonobos, but I, as a bonobo mother or father know what my offspring look like or smell like, or, or, you know, how they behave, you know, how do I make sure that they're advantaged? And those are things that translate directly into human society as well. So mm -hmm. A fair amount of brain power goes into that and a fair amount of, of work and learning that we go through in what is now an incredibly prolonged adolescence compared to other primates um, is learning how to manage that. You know, okay. it's, it's really learning about interactions as well as learning about survival. So uh, it, taking that in, in that direction, what do you think about what does it tell us about the adaptive nature of the brain when we take primates out of their environment, out of their families, and we train them to work with computers or even put Neuralink into their brains? <laughs> right. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, you know, is that a sign of them adapting or of a brain adapting to the new sort of rules that are put in front of it? Or how do we... Can um, wow, that's a, that, that is a big <laughs> question. Um, I think there's a couple of things to that. One... We do adapt to it because if you think about it, I mean, if you took a medieval knight and plunked him down in front of a keyboard and said, you know, this is how you get your message across, they might turn around and hack your head off with a sword. But if they didn't, 15 or 20 minutes into it, they'd figure it out. Yeah. You know, they have eyes that are the same as ours and 10 fingers that are the same as ours. And if you get past the quote unquote magic of technology, the thing that you, you know, explaining to them why plugging something into a wall generates light might be a little bit tricky. But once you get past that, they're going to manage the technology and the utility of it the same way we would. I think what is incredibly valuable about the cultural component of this is we don't directly have to sit a child down and explain to them why when you plug something into the wall, it generates light. Eventually they learn it. And, we, you know, certainly the world would be a worse off place without electrical engineers. But the the inherent knowledge of that or the, the um, assumed it's just the way it is kind of component of that, every society has that. You know, the, the Greeks and Romans had their assumptions about what it was like to exist in a society. And... If you took Socrates himself and said, or Socrates, if, if I'm mangling the Greek again, um, and, and said, you know, here's the smartest man on the planet at the time, let's 
Bill and Ted him right into 21st century San Remo, California, and see what he does, he would have an uncomfortable couple of hours, but he'd adapt. Yeah. You know, and and I think we adapt to incredibly new things without even really thinking about it. And, you know, if you've ever and I've unfortunately felt this several times, if you've ever uh, sprained your ankle or broken, you know, broken a bone and had to be on crutches for a little while. First couple of days are awful. You know, you can't move around. You bump into things. You put a kid on crutches for, you know, a broken leg. And in the six weeks that they're in the cast, by the by the end of day three, they're going to be scooting around with their friends, not even really noticing. And I'm not, I'm not, to be very clear, trivializing the change in, in mobility or putting anybody on the spot of saying, if you have, you know, a different set of, of legs or a different set of abilities, that it isn't a challenge. What I'm saying is that we adapt to things all the time. And the one of the key roles, as I understand it, is of the brain, as ha- someone who's studied it now for quite some time, is matching inputs to outputs. And, and, you know, what is your picture of the world? What is your assumption about what is true? And then what the brain does is take that assumption and stack it up against the incoming information. So your sensory input changes, something happens, there's a a change in your circumstances or your outlook or whatever. You need to fit that into a near-term thing. Is this something that's going to leap out of the bushes and eat me? But you also need to fit it into a long-term thing. You need to ask yourself, okay, you know, I've applied to this program and I didn't get in or I've, you know, sought to be on the select traveling soccer team and I didn't get on that. So that's going to change my goals for and my behaviors for the next, not just few minutes, but maybe for a few years, right? And we deal with those kinds of situations all the time, but it takes an awful lot of brain power to do it. And we're nowhere near getting an artificial system that can do it. And we're nowhere near, I think, understanding how we ourselves do it. Right. So the, the <laughs> technology component is, is critical. It really is a fantastically exciting time to sit and, and think about what has changed in computers and changed in how we work and think and and use them. But if you take a little bit of a longer view, it's really remarkable to me how little we fret about it on a daily basis. You know, just look at COVID. We all suddenly (laughs) went online for a year, you know, disrupted our, what we thought of as our daily lives. And yes, it's been difficult. I'm not going to say for a second that people haven't struggled to adapt, but they have adapted. And that's something that I think, you know, uh, there's an awful lot of brain power and processing power and, and for lack of a better word, memory and attention that goes into doing that without us having to think about it or without us thinking about it consciously too often. Uh, There are people obviously who write and think about this a lot, but I think most of us just go through our day to day and and get through it. Yeah, absolutely. I I mean, I'm, I'm convinced and I'll, I will strive to update my hunter gatherer analogy (laughs) because it's obviously out of whack. Uh, oh, I don't think it, it is. Be I, I don't want to. I don't want to dismiss it. It is an important no, no. concept, but I think <laughs> the, the part of it that gets lost in the noise is the somewhat less romantic but potentially more important component of relationships and yeah. societies. No, that's a, a very good thing to add to it. And I mean, if I just go straight to my agenda, my sure, uh, please. You know what it is that I see in this, and and hope to, without being utopian about it, or you know trying to take on educational reform, although that might be the thing that needs to be done. What I see here, and I've seen it for a long time, and not, I saw it long before Tony Buzan took us around and, you know, we created a communal memory palace together, and I've done it with students when I've been able to teach this live. I think that it's one thing to bring Socrates to, you know, <laughs> the world of Ted, uh, Bill and Ted uh, in the future or our present or whatever, but I think there's something in what you just said, which is you chose Socrates or, you know, like a medieval knight. Those people have something like that maybe is analogous to successful medical students because their culture has trained them to already be more fit to adaptation, perhaps. And I'm not you know, saying that, that that is the case, but would that be the same for not just a slave, but the slave of perhaps an illiterate uh, landowner? It's a fantastic question, and without advocating <laughs> slavery, because I don't. No, no, I don't need to advocate it. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I take your point. I, I think 
you know, that is an area of historical study where if you, if you talk to academic historians, they're sometimes frustrated by how little we know about those people. Right. You know, I mean, I, I didn't choose Socrates other than the Bill and Ted analogy simply because he was, it was so quote unquote, the, the smartest or whatever. He's the Greek that I've heard about, you know, well, just, I could have said Parmenides or Heraclitus or whoever, but you know, where you I'm going with this chain is. of about five people to where it's so obscure that if you're not a professional, you haven't heard of any of these people. So I think we default to the famous, but I, it would be really interesting to know what the day-to-day -day use of this technique was. But I would I would argue that someone who was a blacksmith or you know a skilled tradesperson, I, I cannot conduct, construct a stone wall from nothing, right. um, and yet they did, and they built pyramids and stone walls, and lots of the people who were involved in it were not people whose names we remember. They had to have a technique. They had to have some skills and some learning and some education, obviously an apprenticeship, but also a method for handling that information mm -hmm. that wasn't simply Googling it. Right, right. I mean, where I'm going with this is what I would like to see is I would like to see – every day I get emails from people. Why sure. do teachers not teach these – or why are these techniques taught in schools? And my answer to that is we need educational reform so that every teacher does because they usually are coming at it from the students have to learn this. And I always think, oh, students already have so much to do. But if teachers were required in whatever you call it, teacher certification school, and then it would just sort of naturally trickle down because they would surprise their students. I remembered all your names in five minutes. You know, want to know how I did that? And then they start to apply that to whatever they have to learn, numbers and, and all that sort of stuff. I just see so much hope in what you're finding in this research, and it confirms something that I've already seen. And I'm just sort of wondering, you know, how that we can translate this to perhaps uh, more research that would confirm it further and then potentially be something that could lead to educational reform. Uh, if that's even, you know, desirable, I guess, because in some senses, the education system is working just fine. It's not necessarily that we need to reform it, but I still have a bit of a, a, a picture, an image in my mind of even just 10% of teachers or one teacher per school being a memory expert or a person who can take them out uh, and, and do at least a memory project once a year or something like that, which would have a trickle-down effect, I think, over the decades um, that could lead to more people being able to adapt and if they wanted to go to medical school, being more likely to be able to pass the exams mm. and so forth. So that's <laughs> what I'm trying to, to get at with this. Yeah, uh, that's a, I mean, that's a really good point. And, and I think um, certainly I think the education system works better than we sometimes give it credit for, but also there's always room for improvement. Um, I think that the two things that would make that really pop, if you will, um, and this is, again, just my opinion. I'm not an expert on educational policy. But one thing is that the the component of wanting to do it and, you know, the, the avoidance of going back to what is perceived as just sort of rote learning. Right. And, you know, um, everybody memorized this poem. There might be two or three kids in the class who loved memorizing the poem, but there might be 28 who are sitting staring off in a space going, you know, when does this day end? Right. <laughs> um, and and tedium is always a problem. The, the problem with practicing and learning memory is you have to integrate it with the material. Otherwise, it is just memorizing lists of buddy, butterfly names. Right. And if you're not a lepidopterist or a serious entomologist or if you don't think it's going to get you kicked out of medical school if you don't do it, um, it might get kind of boring to just remember a lot of butterfly names. Right. Um, I think when you integrate it into saying to someone who is, I know Lynn Kelly has talked online about her husband being an avid bird watcher. And so when she does, and I don't want to speak for her, but when she does her, you know, daily rehearsals on days that she knows they're going on bird watching trips, she uses birds as her, you know, recall target. Yeah. Um, and I think that sort of element of enjoyment and of, of having it be relevant is really critical. The other thing that I would say is there is a risk. I, I'm an advocate of, of having a good memory, and I, I think there's no age at which you shouldn't start or work on keeping it tuned because, like anything else, if you don't use it, it'll, it'll go away. Um, the, 
the best possible scenario in my mind would be mixing it with genuine training in critical thinking and saying, okay, is it enough to remember this or just to reproduce it? Or is it enough to really be able to think about it? And I think that is sort of the core goal of any education. How you actually do it is what everybody struggles with under the funding constraints and the time constraints and the, you know, when, when do we stop in my perfect world? Education doesn't stop. You know, I mean, I would, I would love it if I could continue to make my living training people well into their seventies and eighties to do fun things, um, and to do important medical things. But, you know, there are costs and there are time penalties associated with it. And and that may not be realistic. Um, but I think those two elements, the element of fun and the element of, of there being some critical thinking associated with it would tie into that. I think you're, you're on the right track. I think you've got a great sense of, of the potential of it. Um, I would worry if we were just defaulting to everybody just being a walking hard drive. Um, you know, I, I really think that the, the, um, the interesting part and the fun part and the, the fascinating part to me is this idea of the brain as a learning engine as, you know, we, we, we're going to learn stuff, whether we learn the stuff we want to learn or the stuff that we shouldn't learn or this, you know, anybody who has kids or anybody who's raised a puppy or who's um, inadvertently trained their cat to do something other than go in the litter box knows that animal, that child, that person is going to learn what we teach them may not be what we want them to learn, but that's more a problem with the mechanics of teaching than it is with the fact that the person can't or won't learn. They absolutely will. Right. We just have to be careful about how we structure it because you can end up teaching people things that are maladaptive. Well, yeah, and I'm sure that does happen. Um, just about the notion of fun. It, is, it, is it that important? I mean, when I think about how that I use this and how that I've learned anything, I mean, I got a PhD, I got two MAs, and uh, I got a BA before that, and I got through high school somehow. And I just don't remember fun being the game changer. It was more like taking on challenge and and being disciplined and focused. And yeah, I had fun. I mean, there was a there was a mental image of how great this is going to be at the end. And even as I was doing it, I did enjoy some things. But man, there were a lot of books that I didn't want to read. I didn't care about. There were exams I didn't want to go to. And you know. I, I love the work that I do, but fun is is not it's, the requirement. It's a fair it's a fair <laughs> criticism. Maybe the right word is passion, not fun. I mean, yeah. to me, I, I have a PhD. I, there were days that I thought seriously about not continuing with it, right. but overall, the reason I did it and the reason I still do what I do is because I am still a little bit astounded that people are willing to pay me <laughs> to read papers about the thing that I find more interesting than anything else in the world. Right. Um, I think if you translate it into another domain and say, you know, what separates someone who is a recreational athlete from someone who's an Olympic athlete, um, I don't think necessarily that one gets more enjoyment out of it than the other, but both of them need to have a component of fun in order to do the training that they do. Right. Um, I do think that the passion part of it and passion probably is the part that would separate the Olympian from the, you know, average 10 K runner. Um, you know, we all get passionate about different things. I think it's one of the defects or the, the difficulties of any educational setting is you have to accommodate all of the people in front of you. You can't, we don't have the resources to sort of tailor it to everybody's individual desire, right. but even those kids who quote unquote weren't good in school, you know, once they find their interest and their passion, you can't stop them from learning about it. And, and to me as a teacher, the most fun I have is not dragging students through the arcana of neurophysiology because they've made it very clear that that is how they regard it. It's the few students every year who say, wait a minute, clinical neurology is something that really, you know, this fascinates me. This excites me. This is something that I want to know more about that. I want, I'm the dissatisfaction is not with the amount of information, but that there's not enough of it. Right. Yeah. You know? And, and to me, I, every time I get a chance to actually pursue pure research and do something that is, and again, I'm defaulting to this word, but it is for me fun. 
right? I really don't, I don't anywhere near as much begrudge the time that I have to spend doing it to compared to say what I have to do working on a lesson plan for a discipline that isn't one that I'm really super interested in, but needs to get done. Right. Um, you know, I, I don't think anybody relishes the prospect of writing another grant, but I think everybody is willing to write the grant so that they get to do the thing that excites them and that, that, you know, they see the value of, and it's taken me a long time to, to learn even to the limited extent that I can to put myself in someone else's shoes and say, just because I'm not excited by what they do, it doesn't diminish the importance or more importantly, it doesn't diminish the excitement that someone else might see in it. Right. You know, and, and I would look back at my own experience in sports and say, there are some sports that I loathed and didn't want to train for and didn't want to do. But then a couple times in my life, I've been lucky enough to find sports that I found really enjoyable or really well suited to what I wanted to do. And the difference was not in how much training I did, but rather how much I enjoyed the training and how much I was willing to commit the time and the effort and, the, and a certain amount of pain to getting better at it. Um, and so I think if there is anything we could do for kids in school or, or anybody in school at any level, I would say there's two things. One, if there was more flexibility to allow people to explore things that they really liked. And two, I would love it if we could come up with a utopia that you and I share, which would be everybody's in school for the rest of their life, but not necessarily in school to learn the details of, of diagramming sentences, unless that's what you love. If you're a grammarian, by all means, go to grammar school forever. But to have the opportunity to really engage with something and learn something throughout your lifetime, and it probably won't be one thing. Um, maybe I know we're getting toward the end of time, but one book that has come to my attention, so to speak, in just the last few days is a book called um, Micromasteries by Robert Twigger. And he's a person I've, I've read one of his earlier books and I quite like the way he wrote um, a friend of mine who is up in Queensland now, she uh, was visiting us and mentioned that she had heard about this book. Um, he makes the point, and I think it's one that is certainly one that I've heard before but bears repeating, you know, if, if your desire is to learn how to sew, that's a big barrier. You know, you've got a lot of, you didn't, you, to become a tailor might take years of, of hard work and apprenticeship and difficulty. Rather, if you say, I want to learn how to make a shirt, you know, I, I want to make a thing. And, and whatever that thing is, if you want to learn to cook a particular meal and that inspires you to become a chef, that's great. But if you say, I want to learn how to be a chef, you're going to get knocked down the first time you have to sit down and read a book about the theory of cooking. Right, right. You know, but if you say, OK, I'm going to learn how to make the perfect grilled cheese sandwich and then build up from there. The 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 drive to do the hard stuff comes with a little bit of success and a little bit of excitement about getting through the first few basic steps. And that's something we also do badly in education. We throw a lot at people and we convince people that to enjoy a subject, you need to get a PhD in that subject, or you need to get an MD. And, you know, if, if you're interested in anatomy and physiology, the only reason you would want to study those things is because you want to be a doctor. Um, there are people out there, I'm one of them, who just find the whole process fascinating. I'm lucky enough to be able to make my living at it, but I don't have to. You know, there's nothing stopping me from learning those subjects as a as a interest, except that there are not many good instructors or good books out there where someone can teach themselves. Being an autodidact is really hard. Yeah. Being someone who is lucky enough to get a mentor in a field that you like, whether it's purely an academic mentorship or it's you know, just somebody down the street who knows how to do something you don't know how to do. If they're a good natural teacher and can get you excited about the doing, then the minutia of it and the difficulty of it and the, the things that you have to learn that are difficult to do that become, to go back to the word that we started with, fun, you know, or at least at least more tolerable. You're willing to read that book that you don't want to read because the larger goal is so interesting to you. Right. And that, that's something that as a teacher is really hard to get across to people 
you love it when you see the one or two students who in every group who are already doing that. But it's easy to forget that you've got to bring the rest of the students as much as possible to that level if you're going to get it across to them. And that's really hard to do. So I don't think there's one sort of magic bullet fix to the educational system that would make teachers have that. Even the teachers who do have that skill often don't have the time and the money and the availability of, of good resources to do it. So I don't, I don't hold that against them. No, I, I admire teachers uh, almost, you know, without question, because it is quite a, a task they take on. Um, and convincing a school principal in your scenario to, to dedicate a full-time teacher to teaching the art of memory would be a big ask. I mean, you would need a very adventurous and very politically tough school principal to justify that in a budget. I'm aware that I don't work at it hard enough, but the way I see it is a requirement in teacher certification programs. And I'm not sure that that's as big of an ask, uh, but it would still Except be hard. You need somebody to teach the certification program who would themselves have to be an expert in it. So it's, well, you that's know, where it's, we segue it's a, it's to Tyson. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I think it's a great idea. Don't get me wrong. I, I, do, I do think that there is value in this. And I do think that there's, I mean, just based on the feedback we've had from the paper that came out only a week ago, um, you know, there is a widespread interest in it. There's a desire for people to understand it better. Um, I, I am blown away by the response that we've gotten. Um, even, you know, we've had a few, not quite negative, but a few sort of insightful and incisive questions about what we did. And, and I welcome that as well. I mean, that's just academic nature, but it's also, you know, it tells me that people are really thinking about this and are really committed to understanding it, which is just amazing to me. People aren't going like, to let me let me rest if I don't ask you what was at least one of the uh, the pushbacks. Uh, so there was the one that you mentioned in the beginning that, you know, are these really comparable methods? Right. Um, you know, it to, to maybe take it a little bit into your domain, because, uh, you know, the idea of classifying these techniques and saying one is a method of locus or a method of loci, but the other one is a method of loci with a narrative component added to it. You know, that's a valid point. You know, they are not, if I were going to set up a superiority trial and say one thing is better than the other, I would have used two very different techniques. Um, if I were going to find the, the thing that is somehow better than the memory palace, you know, in order to do a study on something and to get a result where we saw an improvement over the memory palace, we had to do more than what the memory palace involves. You know, there had to be that additional narrative component, or maybe there didn't have to be, but there was in our study. Um, so that's a fair criticism. You know, it's not a lot of people, some of the headlines were a little bit um, enthusiastic about this is a superior technique. Some of the more insightful readers pointed out that it's a different technique. Mm -hmm. And comparing them and saying one is better than the other doesn't take into account the fact that one has a feature or a bug that the other one doesn't have. Right, right. Yeah, we yeah. weren't we weren't comparing smartphones here. We were really asking a different question. My concern really is that I just I don't see the difference because of what the memory palace is. It's just a spatial mnemonic. We just use the term memory palace journey method. But I again I I notice and I note that I haven't spoken with Tyson yet. I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but. I guess it's a. It's just a. To me, it seems like a terminal terminological problem, and then the amount of information one has about the potential ways to use a technique. So I want to avoid being territorial myself and saying, "Well, memory palace right. is still like the same thing." But it just I think anybody who would practice this for a sufficient amount of time, the actual term would disappear, because really what you're doing is spatial memory meets autobiographical memory meets episodic memory meets uh, figural memory meets et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. And it's, it's, it sort of transcends some sort of term. Um, but well, well, there's maybe two things about that. One, um, you, you hit on a really critical notion, which is practice. Mm. You know, our study was using people who hadn't been trained, training them for literally only a half an hour and then testing their recall and showing that, in fact, there was quite a dramatic change in their recall. We also followed up with a study much later, six weeks later, where the students weren't told they were going to be asked again. Oh, right. And so they hadn't been practicing that particular list because why, if you were being flooded with first year medical school information, 
would you continue to practice the butterfly list? Um, we didn't get a large sample of students. Unfortunately, we only got eight who were willing to participate at the six week mark. Um, but the data showed pretty clearly that both techniques degraded. It also showed that the lack of rehearsal was a, was a pretty compelling change. You know, this is not a one and done process. No. Practice enters into this. It's something that you, of course, would, would understand, you know, if you're going to work on memory, you have to work on memory. It isn't, it isn't just, I mean, there's no easy sort of magic magic solution i spare you yep. the lecture but the way you use these techniques is you you turn it into a recall process so right. you like go forward and backward middle to the beginning middle to the end you skip the station so you have primacy and recency on every part so a lot of people that, just don't do that uh, that might actually also play out if we had tested a very practiced group of people if we tested memory champions i don't know that we would have seen the same result right. um you know even if they hadn't been exposed to the aboriginal method in the past they might intuitively understand what was being done there. The other thing is that the um, one of the key differences that we did see between the two techniques, and it's, it's why I'm not certain that I completely agree that they're the same techniques. They're certainly over, overlapping components. Um, the thing that stands out to me about them being different is the structured narrative. Right. So the idea that you've got a story going in, because what we saw in the data was in those students who had been trained on the Aboriginal memory technique, they were overwhelmingly more likely to remember the list in order. Because we didn't ask, we didn't ask the participants to remember it in sequence. We just said, write down these, these names. The really quite powerful and quite large effect size that we saw in the difference in sequencing was quite striking. And, and I think that, to me, suggests that the narrative, at least, probably added a, an element of sequence to it that was unconscious because we didn't ask them to do it. But in a memory palace, as you say, you can start from any point and end at any point, and that's a, a, a feature of the memory palace. But in the reproducing of information in this way, if you're, say, learning a procedure, there may be an, an ordered component to it that you need to take into account as well. And the Aboriginal technique inherently did that. Right. Um, and so that that element of the data sort of makes me reluctant to say that they're the same technique because there are clearly some differences that come out when they're applied. The caveat being that they were only applied once and on a first time basis. So if you oh, applied yeah. them over 20 years, it, the differences may very well wash out. I don't know. No, I definitely recognize that. And like I said, that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to talk about this because they're I, I see I see that narrative element, and I also see the introduction of an individual taking the person through it yes. um, as being key differentiators. Uh, and it basically, I, I know uh, we're getting. I want to respect your time, unless you. Oh, I'm have, happy have to keep talking to about. I can talk about anything forever. My core excitement is not to bicker about the terminology, as I hope I expressed, but rather, um, how can we get? How can we get more studies? How can we make this a more yeah. journal, more journalists? Even if the journalists are not quite representing it as we would like in their clickbait <laughs> headlines, I am glad that they did, and I'm glad that it got so much interest. You know. Well, I, uh, I suspect it might have been editors, not journalists, who well, who, yeah, who I, jazzed up the quick the clickbait. I don't want to I don't want to diss anybody, but let's be fair that um, it's the human species. <laughs> collaborating. We all we all love a good story. And I'm as guilty of it as anybody else, right. and I think you know one of the things that stands out to me is that element of having a guide. You know, we put a lot of weight on teachers and we put a lot of, of burden on them to do things properly and everything else. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to be perfect or even an expert at what you do to be a good teacher of it. And I think oh, I having that that guidance element is really important. One of the things that I really push on my students and in medicine in particular is don't wait until you're an expert to teach it to somebody else. You know, really the way to learn something is to be involved in it and interactive with it. But also, you know, as you pointed out, we all love a good, that good sense of, of excitement and, and reward that we get. That also comes when you show somebody how to do something yeah. because it's a little bit of a, you know, don't mean rush to your own skill to say, Oh, look what I did, you know? And, and so that presence of a teacher or that presence of someone 
to help you is an incredible, just powerful thing to overcome the barriers to learning. Um, cause it might just be one, you know, <laughs> to use a clickbait headline, it might just be one simple trick that you're missing. Yeah, you, know, you might just need to know the one thing that you need to do to make this a little bit to get past this step. Yeah. Um, and I certainly have benefited from a lot of really skilled instructors in my lifetime who I later found out weren't experts necessarily. They were just people who really cared. And to me, I mean, the, the analogy that I always use is the human brain is is much more a Swiss army knife than it is a hammer. You know, right, right. you're. You can do one thing really well with a hammer or a screwdriver, and you can mess up a lot of things with a hammer or a screwdriver using them improperly. Um, if what you have in front of you is a bunch of different things that you have to do, I'd take a Swiss Army knife any day. And I don't know, I don't know if that's going to get you in trouble with the Swiss Army brand, but <laughs> I, I happen to have a bunch of them, so I'm just going to go and lay it out there. I'm sure um, they're happy for the marketing. <laughs> I love a good multi-tool, if you will. Um, yeah. Because it is really, you know, it is really the case that we don't know what you're going to come across in a given day, having as many tools as available. And I think that goes to your point about technique, having as many techniques available and having as much opportunity to practice them and learn them as can be given to you is a strength, not a weakness by all means. You know, Absolutely. so I, I think you're, you're absolutely right that the training process is something that should be more widespread. And I do get excited about that as well. So, well... With all that in mind, let's talk just briefly about the future. Do you have plans to dig deeper into this or what's coming um, up next for you generally? I don't in the, in the near term have another research study planned. Um, it, the fact that it took us you know, two and a half years to get from the uh, data collection to getting the paper out, a lot of that is just the difficulty of coordinating schedules with all the different authors. But you know, there is a fair amount of work that goes into it as well. Um, and so a formal research project, no, we would like to incorporate some of this teaching into the medical curriculum. You know, it was, it was meant to be a practical application. Um, there's a couple of barriers to that one COVID has gotten in the way, right. everything being online now has made it much more difficult to schedule and much more difficult to include things in the curriculum that are not sort of what we passingly refer to as core knowledge. Um, the other part of it is I feel very strongly that the the cultural element of this is important and is something that shouldn't be overlooked. Right. And so I was very happy to be working with Tyson and have Tyson there to, to guide this instruction and to do the work. And fortunately for him and unfortunately for us, he's now at another university. So we don't have him as an instructor anymore. And that has slowed our, our ability to work it in because I, I really do think that the, the um, both from an indigenous health teaching point of view, but also from a cultural sensitivity and cultural safety point of view, it, if we're going to teach it as the Aboriginal method per se, um, it ought to be done by people who are expert in and members of the Aboriginal community yeah. and who have that knowledge at a deep level, not the sort of very surface level that I have it. And I, I'm very, very committed to that idea. I'm hopeful that in the next couple of months, we're going to find out that we have um, access to another educator or to Tyson again, maybe. Um, don't tell him I said that because I don't know that we're, we're not actively recruiting Tyson for the purposes of whoever at Monash might be listening to this. I, um, I would love it. I would love it to have him as a guest lecturer again, is the way that I would phrase it. Right. Um, and I, if we got that opportunity, then I would love to have that embedded in the curriculum again. Um, but right now it's a bit on hold. Well, I don't know what I could do to support, but consider my, um, my best effort in any support already, uh, already there and happy to write a letter or you know, whatever it takes. Uh, I, I, oh, I look, want to I'd see love to have you involved. I mean, if, if we can work out, I'm, um, you know, podcast timing aside, if there's an opportunity to meet and talk in the future, um, or to get you down to, to Melbourne and have you, um, you know, have a go at our medical students. I, I'd love that. I think that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I, I, th I think I have some insights that could lend itself to um, b both the, I don't know, the meta level design of a study, plus the actual implementation. And I would, I cannot interpret data. So I should just step <laughs> out of that. But uh, 
even if it's just as a as just you know saying some things that I think uh, could be useful, and I'm very happy to do it. Also, you know, I'm fairly in contact uh, if I need to be. I haven't talked to him for a while, but with Alex Mullen. He mm-hmm. was third time, three-time world memory champion, and he's also, I believe, he's through his uh, or he's in his residency now. Um, okay. So, and I have interviews with him where we've talked about his approach to medical. If I'm wrong about this, I don't want to include it in the box. Is, is that the medical nemnimus, nem, uh, nemnist site? Is he? Uh, the- no, his site is Mullen Memory. Well, no, no, no. I, okay. I think sorry. it's yeah. Chase DeMarco who has right. medical okay. nemesis. I, I had heard the na- I had heard both of those names, and I knew the the one website, but I right. misattributed. I, um, I don't know if Alex would 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 necessarily respond because he's been very busy. Uh, it's been about a year since we corresponded, but nonetheless, I do already have I've already picked his brain several times on on the medical angle that he's approached this with, and um, I, I I just see nothing but possibility for this. We're already in a mnemonics renaissance. We've been in it for a long time, uh, for at least 25 years, uh, if not longer. And uh, I can just see it exploding. There's a few things that challenge it. It may be that you know it's peaked and starting to go down. But these are the kinds of things where I think that it can just get bigger and bigger. I think it has a huge potential. I also, I mean, one of the questions I've gotten a lot and that we've thought about a lot, you know, we, we've did this in an educational context. It's, it's part of the medical education curriculum and so on. So many people have asked me and have, have expressed an interest who are just, you know, how do I incorporate this into my daily life and who are um, in many cases deeply concerned as they get older that their memory may not be what it used to be. Or in some cases, you know, obviously people are living with people who have dementia or, or frankly suffering from dementia themselves. And, you know, the, the need is there both as a prophylactic approach to say, the more you know going in, the you know the longer it's going to take for that to go away. Um, but also as a a continuing education approach, the idea that just because someone is getting older or struggling with memory doesn't mean they can't still benefit from training in the same way that someone who's had an injury might benefit from physical therapy. Um, and there's a lot I think that um, people would love to both know about and have access to. Um, so there, I think there is a tremendous amount of potential to to be exploited there. And I don't use exploited in the bad sense there, no, but no. rather to, you know, there's a lot of room for us as educators, but us as a society as well to take better care of our memories and to be more involved in what happens to them over the course of a lifetime, training them when we're young, keeping them going when we're in our middle age and, and adulthood and you know, maintaining them in arts and essence is really something that we need to take more seriously and do a better job of. Absolutely. I don't know if you know it, but Casper uh, Borman is his name. He has a TEDx or a TED Talk, uh, one of the two, that uh, he's showing his research with helping people with dementia and Alzheimer's use models of their homes to help them remember the names of their loved ones. I don't know if you ever saw that. but I, I've seen, yeah, actually I have seen that and I, I think it's um, fantastic in its approach. Again, you know, the, the the number of bodies that need to get involved in doing that and to be, you know, it's not just having that as a possibility, but having access to the care is something, you know, because you need carers who understand that and who are willing to put the time and energy in and who are compensated for putting the time and energy in. Um, I think that would be a fantastic improvement. And as much as I love the cutting edge of neuroscience and the technology approach, you know, the, the things that we often work with in a laboratory that might cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and be, you know, years of effort to get one result, it's very, very difficult to translate that into therapy and a working community and to for people to incorporate it into their regular lives. Right. A lot of room and a lot of the potential that you've identified is stuff that we don't need millions of techn- dollars of technology to do. We just need a bit of drive and commitment and as well as people who are skilled in the art to kind of spread it around. So I'm, I think that's a great idea. Well, thank you so much again for doing this. And I do look forward to following up and I just reiterate my my passion <laughs> so to, uh, to, oh, look, to, to helping with anything that I can be a, of assistance with. I'm all about building networks because that's what I <laughs> that's what I do. So, um, you know, if, if we can keep that network alive, I'd love it. 
Speaking of which, if uh, people want to find you online or connect, what's the best way to do that that you can um, transmit so early and I can add a link to uh, where this is um, being published? So if they want to know a bit more about me and my research, there's the, the Monash University website has um, sort of my professional bio up there. Um, I don't maintain a website. My Twitter is D underscore or D research, excuse me, D R E S E R underscore neuro. Um, and I've revived a lot of my Twitter activity in the last, uh, few days since this paper has come out, I've built out that network a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm becoming more socially media active, um, whether it's entirely willing and enthusiastic is another thing to be seen, but I've enjoyed it. Um, so I, hopefully that, that presence will grow a little bit as well. Um, and yeah, just um, the email that's in the paper. Uh, the, as I said, the public library science is an open access research forum. So if you want to read the paper, it's there. Um, all the contact details to get in touch with me directly are there. And yeah, I'd love to hear people's thoughts. Excellent. Well, thank you again. And um, I really, really appreciate it. Anytime. And I hope we can talk again soon. <laughs>